Hi. <laughs> so I started this podcast beginning of this year, completely fell off with it, but we are getting back. And um, I intended my third episode to be about my uh, decade long, am I seeing dead people or do I have other issues? <laughs> so if that intrigues you, uh, come back because I will be eventually posting that episode, but actually, I, last night, I watched the, Jeff the Jeffrey Dahmer tapes uh, that's new on Netflix, and Jeffrey Dahmer is having a resurgence. There's a Ryan Murphy, Jeffrey Dahmer show that I initially wasn't going to watch, but so many people are saying that it's good that I started watching it. I think I'm like three or four episodes away from the end. There's about 10 episodes, but I was more interested in the documentary because you get to see him, hear him. Um, initially, I really just was like, why another documentary? Why another show? And then I realized I am 36 years old. Dahmer was caught in the early 90s. I was a little kid and growing up, the biggie serial killers were Dahmer, Gacy, Bundy, Ramirez, but I am no longer a young whippersnapper and I realized that there's a whole generation of people behind me that may not be as familiar. And so when you live long enough, Things are going to come back around and I think that that's what this is. Even though I feel like true crime has always been popular and people have not forgotten these old serial killers, but they're going to be revisited and let's face it, people know that it's going to make them money, but it's hard to come out with any new information. Although this documentary does talk about the people that were around at the time when Dahmer was doing the things that he was doing. And so I guess it makes sense that it came out, especially with the new Dahmer show. But there were, you know, there were some things that maybe I didn't know, which is always good when you come out with something new that's been done before. You want to put in something. You want to give people something they didn't know or they haven't seen before. So this is three episodes. They're each about an hour long, I think. I did watch them all in one sitting, so. But they talk a lot to one of like I think the only female lawyer on his team it was her first case I believe and it's weird because um well I guess if you haven't seen the episode I should just kind of give an overview which I guess is pretty obvious you know it's about Jeffrey Dahmer his life when he was younger his family uh where things went wrong his crimes they delve into the victims uh, all the way to his trial, his sentencing, and his death. So I don't know if we've heard from his lawyers before. It's been a while since I've seen anything on Jeffrey Dahmer. So I don't know if we've heard from his lawyers before, but it's interesting hearing her talk about how she got close to him which isn't really a spoiler because in the previews you see that. I, I mean, I've never been a lawyer before. I've never, I don't know. Like, I guess I shouldn't say how weird it is that you would get close to somebody like him to the point where you like, you care about what happens to him in prison and would actually say that you became close to him, but I don't know very interesting and it feels like a long time ago that all this happened but also so many people from that time are still around so you're able to hear from them which is interesting 
But if you don't want to hear spoilers, if you haven't seen the documentary, pause. But do be sure to come back. <laughs> because I'd like to talk about it, you know? Um, people are really into true crime. I've been into true crime my whole life since I first started watching Unsolved Mysteries. And actually, in a week or two, the third volume of Unsolved Mysteries is coming back or coming out on Netflix, which is perfect. I think the last time... I think it's been a couple years since the second volume came out. And I really like the reboot of Unsolved Mysteries on Netflix. So look out for an episode on that when that comes out. Because I will definitely be doing an episode on that. I can't not. And actually, that's part of how this podcast was founded. Beyond Unsolved. Beyond Belief, which is another show from the 90s. Which if you, if you haven't seen it, they're on Amazon Prime. And it is good cheesy fun but also so creepy I still get goosebumps at those episodes but beyond unsolved unsolved coming from unsolved mysteries so I'll also uh the first episode of this podcast was about an old unsolved mysteries episode I still plan on going through all of the old unsolved mysteries episodes catalog but um also just general true crime. So that is the show, Unsolved Mysteries, is the show that I don't want to say sparked a love for true crime because, ew, but um, sparked an interest. And I think that so many people are so morbidly curious about that subject. So anyway, I just went on a whole tirade. Let's get into the documentaries or the documentary episodes. So, um, the lawyer and I forget her name because you're going to learn <laughs> that I'm bad at names. Uh, but she's a female lawyer. She talks about how, when she met Jeffrey Dahmer and was working on his case, conducting all these interviews that she felt a lot like Clarice Starling. She was repulsed by the things that Dahmer was saying, but if she let him know that, if any of them let him know that, he wouldn't share or be as open as he was. And he never tried to deny what he did. He was very matter of fact about what he did and owned it all. But he genuinely didn't know why he was the way he was. He felt like he couldn't control the way that he was. And he genuinely wanted to know what was wrong with him. So she had to be non-judgmental and I've seen episodes, I've seen interviews with him before as well as other old serial killers, but it is still so strange. Like seeing him in interviews and hearing him talk about what he did because in the interview, he's, he's just in a room talking like a normal person about really fucked up shit that he did. And one of the things that people say about Jeffrey Dahmer is some people thought he was good looking and normal looking. And you wouldn't think that he would be cutting up and eating people and creating zombies in his apartment with people so close to him on all sides. And they were also surprised about what was going on feet from their apartment. And so that is, I think, what fascinates people about some of these killers is, especially if they're not, if they don't look like a killer, which what does a killer look like? I guess people assume that somebody who does these types of things is like, we're looking not attractive, dirty, like you could spot them like, yeah that tracks. Dude over there looks like a serial killer. They talked to one of the reporters that was able to see into his apartment. They were on the scene when they were collecting evidence, moving everything out of his apartment. And he couldn't go inside, but he could stay basically in the doorway. And when he was looking in, he said just looking around, his apartment looked unremarkable. Mostly, that is. <laughs> but of course, if you look closer, you know, I guess this might have been when they already took the evidence out because dude had skulls hanging around. He had a head in the fridge. He had bodies in vats. He had bodies just laying around. 
And by the way, I obviously, well, I, it should be obvious I have sympathy for, you know, the, the victims and their families. My personality is if I can inject hum humor or sarcasm in something, I do. That's just like how I deal with life. But I'm by no means making light of any of this stuff. That is fucking horrific and like cannot imagine being faced with somebody in a situation like that. So probably should give that disclaimer even though I feel like it should be obvious, but I'm going to give that disclaimer anyway for anybody that has, that takes issue with my approach. So when Dahmer was caught, the first thing that he said was just shoot me now because he knew, he knew what he had in that apartment and all of his evidence against him. And he confessed right away. He was honest about everything. His defense, because he was like, I did this, there was no denying that he did this. He was not going to get a, get off again because that's one of the points in this documentary. It's one of the points in the Dahmer show is that dude got chance after chance after chance after chance, which could be because of who he was, what he looked like. And it's just scary what happens when you give somebody so many chances. And he was doing fucked up stuff before. But he got so many chances. Police didn't want to get involved because they knew that I get... I, I was so young when all this happened, but I don't know if it's like this now as much. But apparently... Police officers didn't like to get involved in homosexual relationships. They didn't take them seriously. They didn't help when people needed help. Um, scary. Scary. If you think about it, if you put yourself in someone's shoes who was living that at the time, who went through it, who didn't make it out of the situation with Dahmer, and nobody would help them they were not people were not taking seriously um jesus like that is a terrifying world to live in so because he confessed the the task at hand for his defense team was to determine if he was insane and i like i don't have any actual experience in any of this but I did take some classes because I have a bachelor's degree in legal studies I had wanted to go to law school but I didn't um but this is one of the things that you learn in those classes or like criminal justice classes somebody who's not familiar with what can make somebody legally insane would look at what Dahmer did and say yeah obviously he was insane but from what my from my understanding is to be insane, legally insane, you basically have to know, to not know what you did was wrong. I think that is really what it hinges on. And he knew that it was wrong. And you can have a mental illness and not be mentally insane. You can be guilty, but mentally insane. Um, and I'm Jesus, you can, you can be guilty, but mentally ill. Guilty, but mentally ill or an insane verdict or two different things, if I'm correct. So in the documentary, it kind of starts from the beginning, his childhood, his dad was absent because he worked a lot. His parents fought. His mother probably, I think, had postpartum anxiety, depression. He had a brother that was, I believe, six, six years-ish, years younger than him and got more attention because he was the baby. So he felt alone a lot, which that is one of the things that he talks about for why he did what he did is he didn't want his partners to leave him. So he was always alone, apparently, always lonely from day one. But he knew that he was gay from the age of 13 and he wanted somebody to be completely submissive to him. He claims that it was never his objective to kill anybody, but he wanted 
to keep them. And there's one part of the documentary where there's a reporter on the scene and he's talking back to the reporters in the studio and he's describing what has been found in, in Dahmer's apartment. And you see the clip of these reporters and they're literally like jaws dropped. They had no questions, like dead air. They did not know what to say. They were just like, for like a prolonged period of time. <laughs> so back to his childhood, um, well, actually, I think he was 18 by this time. When his mother left, his mother up and left. So his dad thought that his mom was staying at the house with the kids. And he like went and I guess he was probably like screwing around, I think. But his mom took his younger brother, left Dahmer at this house. So his dad doesn't know that the mom is gone. Dahmer's at the house alone. And when his mom leaves, she he never sees her again. And the dad has been gone for months. So Dahmer is literally living alone in this house, drinking constantly, getting into some shit. This is when he starts the killing. I think he kills one time and then doesn't do it again for a while. But, and then just side note, you know, obviously I know that his mom had issues mentally but as a mom, I have a three-year-old little girl. I only have one kid, but even if I have multiple kids, like how do you leave a child? I know Dahmer was 18. I know he was 18, but still he didn't want her to go. I think he asked her not to go. And she's like, dude, you're an adult. But at the same time, like your kids are always your kids and she abandoned him. And like, even if your kid's an adult, don't you still want to check up on them and be close with them and see them, you know? Because even if somebody is fresh, freshly 18, you're still a kid. You don't know what you're doing. You need your parents still. I don't know. I just was just like, man, that mom. I don't know if you can hear my kid crying. She's with her dad, like, at some part, in some part of the house. I don't know what happened. But anyway, she's fine. Actually, she's probably just really tired because we went to um, this farm that had pumpkins and stuff. Um, and we were there for like an hour and a half. And I think she's just like worn out. Oh, she's calling my name. She's fine. She's with her dad. <laughs> Actually, I'm going to be shit. I'm going to be seeing her pretty soon because I, I need to take over. And put her to bed but anyways let's just get through this this episode the only mental disorder that i heard anybody talk about relating to Dahmer was necrophilia how did they not find other mental illnesses i i will never understand yeah they only mentioned they had necrophilia but surely like their their dude had a smorgasbord. Am I saying that right? <laughs> I don't know if it's smorgasbord, smorgasborg, smor the word makes no sense now. I don't even know how to say it. Of issues. Dude had to have a laundry list of mental illness, but the only thing I heard anybody talk about was the necrophilia. Cause duh. But back to Dahmer's backstory, he was an alcoholic. He failed college. He was an army. He was in the army as a field medic flunked out of that too, but that is how he learned to identify organs. Okay. The first person that he killed was a hitchhiker, I think. Um, and he talks about having scattered the remains in his yard. But if you are watching the documentary, But if you're watching the documentary, it looks like his house was out in the middle of the woods. So I guess maybe you would think they're like parts of animal or something. I don't know. But that's what he did because just another way of keeping them with him, like on his property, because he was living at home at the time. And in the interviews, one of the ways that they kept Dahmer comfortable and talking was they gave him copious amounts of cigarettes and coffee. But Dahmer also talked about how he 
you know, he was asked about actual relationships that he had with people. And he said that he couldn't because he lived with his family. His living situation wasn't ideal. But he, after he moved out of his parents' house, he lived with his grandma for a time. And he talks about how his grandma purposely ignored the signs of what he was doing, but he deeply loved her. And he even called her the perfect grandma. So when he was living with her, he stole a store mannequin and took that back home. And uh, was intimate with it, but was ultimately disappointed as you would be if you're trying to bone a mannequin. He wanted the real thing. And so one of his jobs that he had was working in a chocolate factory, which sounds kind of amazing. <laughs> I love chocolate. Then he talked about what he actually used to start drugging people uh, because he, from the first time he killed somebody to when he began killing was um, nine years. So he used Halcyon, which was his own sleep medication, and he started drugging men in bathhouses just so that they couldn't leave and he could dominate them because his big thing was he loved snuggling and listening to their heartbeat. But he would often like give these men way too much of his sleep medicine. So the next person that he murdered after his nine year hiatus was a man that he took to a hotel and he says he didn't mean to murder him. Like the first two he didn't mean to do, but he was drunk too. And when he woke up, this guy was dead. He claims that he doesn't remember doing it, but that he must have done it. But that while he was intoxicated, he just let go of his inhibitions and did what he really wanted to do. And so this man wound up dead. But after that, after that nine year hiatus and the accidental murder, it started his compulsion to kill. And an another thing that's referenced a lot is how much he loves The Exorcist Three. I don't think I've ever seen it. I've seen the first one, classic, you have to see it. I've seen the second one, but I don't remember a lot about it. I probably need to revisit it, but like, now I kind of feel like I, I've heard that The Exorcist Three is actually really good. <laughs> but like knowing it was Dahmer's favorite movie kind of makes me feel weird about it. But when he would watch The Exorcist Three, supposedly he would rock back and forth and start speaking gibberish. And I swear if I was like back at a dude's house and he started doing that, I would fucking run for the door, like run and not stop running, <laughs> like, cause what the fuck? And so that's what this guy does. He hits Dahmer over the head and escapes. This is the one that finally brings everything to the end. You know, he actually gets the police to go back to Dahmer's apartment and that is when he gets caught. The officer who found the head in the fridge actually had to retire early from the nightmares. He could not do it anymore. And I can imagine, you know, the stuff that people see, just a regular, a regular killing, you know what I mean? Like, this is pretty depraved, the Dahmer story. So I'm sure when you see something like this that goes on for as long as it did and is has so many fucked up details as it does, there's, you know, necrophilia, there's cannibalism, that would probably especially fuck somebody up. So I can only imagine, you know, that people can do these jobs for these police jobs for so long because like it has got to fuck you up mentally. And one of the things that actually annoys the shit out of me with the Dahmer thing, with the Dahmer, situ the, the Dahmer thing, the Dahmer situation, the Dahmer case is he really plays up the pity card. He tries to get people to feel bad for him. He says, you know, I just, I just wanted these people to stay with me. It's like, dude, you got men to come back with you to your apartment. You got people interested in you. You're just a piece of shit who wanted to kill. You wanted to do this. You could have had a real relationship. And it sounds like, was it Tony? The man who was deaf, it sounded like he probably spent the most time with, with him because they had seen each other before. It wasn't 
that he took him back to his apartment the first night and killed him. So it's like, he could have had a relationship with this man. But Dahmer was so sick and he wasn't driven to do this because he was lonely. I mean, he knew he was sick, but he did this for no other reason than he was just a sick, evil person. If you didn't want people to leave you. And it's not, it's not like he couldn't get anybody because like everybody says, he wasn't a bad looking guy and he clearly got so many men to go back to his apartment. So he could have had a real meaningful relationship. He just didn't want one. He wanted to do these things that he did for no other reason than he just wanted to do them. And also was severely mentally ill. So one of the ways that he would get people to come back to his apartment was he would pay them to take their picture. And I feel like if that just like really goes into somebody's like, I don't know, narcissism or whatever, like if you go up to somebody and you're like, oh my God, you're so good looking. Like, let me take your picture. Like, would I fall for some shit like that? I'd be like, oh my God, thank you. But I, 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 I wouldn't fall for that. Not, I mean, teenage me bless her. Like she probably would have, but no, no, I don't know. I was pretty dumb back then. 36 year old me, hell no. <laughs> I wouldn't do it now, but I don't know. You know, like you play into somebody's like vanity. And I guess also if you need the money, I guess that makes sense why he would, he would have lured so many people back to his apartment. The first time he gets caught and has to go to jail, he assaults a 13 year old boy and only gets a year of work release. I, I don't know how it was back in the 80, like late 80s, early 90s, where you are a grown man and you were caught assaulting a 13 year old boy and you only get one year work release. Meaning he basically just like lived at a jail but was able to leave to go to work and he only did that for a year. And the judge said that he wasn't, I think this is, I might be like mixing up the documentary and the movie, but I think that the judge didn't tell his boss, like he kept his job and he didn't tell his boss like why he was on work release. So this judge was trying to give him a second chance, um, even though <laughs> he didn't deserve it. He fooled everybody. He had this really good facade. It seems like he was able to just talk his way out of anything and the fact that he looked unthreatening, people just never held him accountable. At the time that Dahmer was killing people, the AIDS epidemic was at its, it was at its highest maybe. And so because of that alone, the AIDS epidemic, people were going missing. So his murders coincided with that. And you never knew what wound up happening to these people. And that is another reason why Dahmer was able to um, get away with what he was doing for so long. But they went um, into detail with the way that Dahmer kept his apartment. He at one point had bodies in his tub and I guess dudes still need to shower. So he didn't even bother taking the bodies out of the tub and he would just shower with them in there. His apartment, I've seen pictures and video and then I've seen it recreated for this latest show. It looks so dark and scary in there. When Dahmer couldn't keep his victims as zombies because he tried. He tried this one person, he drilled a hole in his head and was able to get him to follow simple commands, but he was super out of it. He drilled a hole in another person's head and put muriatic acid into it to try and create a zombie. None of it ever worked. So he decided that because he couldn't keep them as zombies, he would 
consume them to keep them within himself forever. And he would also keep the bones as trophies. And at one point in the documentary, I think they said that he believed that he had about 40 pounds of human meat in his freezer at one time. And when asked how much he'd consumed, would he say, about 10 pounds, he said he consumed. He had made, they had the actual drawing that he had made of an altar that he'd planned to put together in his apartment. He believed, and it included bones, just parts of his victims, he believed that it would he would drive some sort of power from this altar. The drawing had been signed by him and the defense tried to use that to go towards his insanity defense. His female defense attorney had received death threats and at one point she was, um, I guess, like in a pool hall or somewhere that had a pool table because one of the victim's families tried to attack her with a pool cue. I wonder if the rest of them got death threats or it was just her. Sounds like it was just her because there was a whole team defending Dahmer, but she made it sound like it was only her that received the death threats. But alas, despite their efforts, Dahmer was not declared insane. And in fact, because Wisconsin had no death sentence, he got 15 consecutive life terms in prison. And as so many people do in prison, at one point, Dahmer tried to find Jesus. And so he requested to be baptized. And so he was. And the person who did his baptism said, the day that Dahmer was baptized, John Wayne Gacy was also put to death and there was a total solar eclipse. And some people think that all that has some kind of significance, but it's probably just a coincidence, but very interesting coincidence nonetheless. His prison job was cleaning floors, but for a year he was kept isolated from other prisoners, but Poor Dahmer was not mentally stimulated enough and really wanted to be put in general population against his lawyer's advice because she was worried for him. She, she told him he wouldn't survive. He would be killed if he moved to general population. Going back to how she said that they had uh, connected and she had gotten close to him. And so she was worried for his well-being. So, of course, as we all know, she was right. And Dahmer was killed with a barbell, barbell, which somebody pointed out was ironic because he used gym equipment with the first person that he killed. So his ending had, had, you know, his, everything had come full circle and his ending was fitting. And so after Dahmer was killed, his dad did an interview and maybe it's just everybody is different, but if I was in that situation and my kid had done the things that Dahmer had done and I just like in the wake of tragedy like that, I would not be giving interviews. I would be doing what Dahmer's brother did and I would change my last name and go into hiding. But his dad just seemed to always, he wrote a book apparently, which I, I, I'll probably read because apparently part of his book talks about how, or was it in his book? I heard somewhere recently after this Ryan Murphy, Jeffrey Dahmer show came on was, or maybe, no, I think maybe it was an interview he did with Dahmer because he done interviews with his son after his son had been caught. Like, what the fuck? Couldn't it be me? But I believe he confessed to having similar dark thoughts, but just he... Um, possess the willpower not to act on them. Jesus Christ. Initially, when this happened, people were questioning if this was some kind of an inside job to kill Dahmer because he was a high-profile prisoner and people just thought that 
prisoners are always watched. There's no way that this should have been able to happen. And so they thought that it was orchestrated by people within that weren't happy that Dahmer couldn't get the death sentence. And so they made it happen, but an investigation was conducted and supposedly they found no wrongdoing on the prison's part. Other thing that I thought was weird was there's a clip in the documentary from an interview that Dahmer's biological mom did, which is very strange considering the fact that she hadn't seen her son since he was 18 years old. In the interview, she said that she didn't think that the prison was at fault. But I just, if I had abandoned my kid, if I hadn't seen him since I abandoned him when he was 18 years old, which again, you can argue if the kid's 18, you're, they're an adult and you're not abandoning them. But regardless, you don't have contact with him all these years. Like, I just... I mean, I know Dahmer was a monster, yes, but at the same time, like, I just feel like you, you're just an asshole, you know, if you favor one kid over the other and you run away with that kid and you forget about a whole other kid that you had. And just because a kid is 18, they don't stop needing their parent. Like, you just don't. I don't know. I don't, that was just fucked up. It was fucked up and it was just kind of disgusting that she was giving interviews about it because I just don't think that she, as much of a monster as Dahmer was, like that aside, you abandon him, just stay wherever you are and just shut up is my opinion, but I could be wrong. <laughs> Another little tidbit that I thought was interesting, which again, I feel like if you're going to do a new documentary on something that has been done and done and done time again, provide something new. And maybe this had been mentioned before, but I had never heard it. Jeffrey's belongings from his apartment, his belongings, yes, all of them, all the gruesome belongings were auctioned off to the highest bidder. And luckily the person that bought it, all of them, uh, had them destroyed. So truly, I guess aside from displaying them in some kind of a museum, like a, some kind of a macabre museum, which they exist, I don't even know if that's like the proper thing to do. But aside from that, um, like destroying them is really the only decent thing to do. And they donated the money that they raised from the auction to the victim's family. So very good. The apartment complex where Dahmer lived, nobody, everybody that lived there still got together and decided that they no longer wanted to live there. And the complex was torn down. So all the footage that you see of the complex was old footage. It no longer exists, which again, I think is really the only thing to do. The only thing to do. <laughs> But that is it. Those are my thoughts about the documentary. I thought it was a good documentary. If uh, I think it's worth checking out. So like I said, I'm getting back on this podcast. Um, I also will be posting these videos on YouTube on my YouTube channel, Alexandra Matthews. Beyond Unsolved has an Instagram under the same name. So if you liked this video on YouTube, like, comment, subscribe, stick around. I've got a lot more of these coming. I also have another podcast called Horror Mom. So if you like horror, classic horror, all horror, I just covered the uh, Hulu's version or, you know, the Hellraiser, the new Hellraiser movie on Hulu. Same thing. I post the video version on Alexandra Matthews. I post on its own podcast, Horror Mom, and Horror Mom has a Instagram. So like, comment, subscribe to all of those things, and I will see you in my next video.